According to the Open Web Application Security Project, or perhaps better known as OWASP, injection attacks, including common cross-site scripting and SQL injection, was the number one risk on the OWASP top 10 list in 2017. As of 2021, the most recent data shows injection attacks have dropped to the third position on the list, with broken access controls and cryptographic failures taking first and second place. Regardless of this minor drop in position, I think injection attacks are still concerning and easy enough to execute. So what can we do to defend our web applications against these attacks? Other than ensuring proper validation, filtering and sanitization of our user inputs, we can add an additional layer of security by implementing a web application firewall or WAF. I'm going to show you how to set up your OpenSense firewall as a basic WAF by easily installing and configuring a plugin. Again. Let's get started. Hey guys, I'm Lyle and welcome to my channel. Before we get into any configurations, let's quickly talk about injection attacks. An injection attack is when a threat actor has the ability to provide a malicious input to a web application, usually through an input field that is not being coded to cater for input filtering or validation, that results in the web application ex executing unexpected or unwanted commands on the server hosting the web app. Injection attacks come in all shapes and sizes, however one of the most common is SQL injection where the threat actor attempts to insert a SQL statement into a compromised input field, attempting to query, update or even worse delete the data in the application's database. Another common attack using this methodology is a command execution attack where a threat actor attempts to run multiple commands disguised as a single command which targets the underlying operating system attempting to retrieve information like usernames or unencrypted passwords or other details that may allow them to get an initial foothold on the system. Injection attacks can lead to various negative outcomes such as privilege escalation, data breaches or even denial of service. So how does a web application firewall help mitigate these attacks? The WAF operates at layer 7 of the OSI model and it monitors HTTP traffic between the web application and the internet, filtering out any potentially malicious requests by matching typical patterns described in its configured rules. The pattern matching will look out for a combination of symbols and keywords that may for example represent a SQL statement or a shell command and block the communication before it executes on the server. This will make more sense when we work through the WAF configuration. First, you'll need to update your firewall and then install the OS Nginx plugin. If you don't already know, Nginx is a popular HTTP server and reverse proxy. Included in this plugin is NAXI, which is the abbreviation for Nginx Anti-XSS and SQL Injection and is the WAF module we're going to configure. I've already installed the Nginx plugin on my OpenSense firewall. However, installing plugins is very simple. You just click on the little plus or the install button on the extreme right and it'll install the plugin for you. Next, we're going to change the port that OpenSense listens on to access its dashboard because Nginx needs to be listening on port 80 and 443 for the web traffic and we don't want to create any conflicts. So to do this, you're going to head over to System Settings Administration and we're going to change the TCP port to 8443. Initially, this will be 443. That's the default port that the OpenSense dashboard listens on. And then just below that, you're going to select the Disable Web GUI Redirect rule. And once you've done this, you'll scroll right down to the bottom and you'll click on the Save button. Once you've logged back into the OpenSense firewall on port 8443, we're going to head over to Services Nginx Configuration and we're going to start with our upstream settings. The upstream server is the actual server running your web application behind the firewall and it could be in your DMZ or your LAN or any other network that you have configured for this purpose. So we're going to go over to Upstream, we'll click on the drop down and we're going to select the upstream server. I've already created a upstream server here, which points to my web app. However, when you do this initially, you'll just click on that little plus sign to, to add your server. And then it's going to bring up a menu that looks like this. 
you're going to just give it a name i called mine dvwa dash server and the actual server ip address that you're pointing to the port that the server is listening on which in this case is port 80 and then just the server priority you can set as one once you've done that you'll click on save Next, we're going to configure the upstream load balancer. These settings allow you to link your upstream servers created in the previous steps to the load balancer, essentially allowing you to load balance between multiple instances of the web app if you require that kind of scalability. In our case, we only have one server that we need to include. So we're going to go over to upstream, we're going to click on the drop down, and then we're going to select upstream. I've already created an upstream load balancer here. However, it's a similar process to before where you'll click on the little plus or the add button and then it'll bring up a menu that looks like this. And once again, just give it a description. I just called mine dvwa underscore upstream. And then from the server entries, we're going to select the server which this load balancer is going to connect to. In my case, it was dvwa underscore server that we configured in the previous step. And we can just leave the, the load balancing algorithm and all the other settings as default over here. However, if this was a production environment, you may want to or I wouldn't say may, you probably will want to enable TLS and those kind of settings here. So for the simplicity of this lab, I've just left that out for now, but that's something to keep in mind if this is a production environment. Once you've done that, you'll simply click save. Once the upstream configurations are done, we need to create a policy for Naxi and download the core rules to get started. So to do this, we're gonna head over to HTTPS and click on the drop down and we're going to go to Naxi WAF policy. Initially, the policy will be empty. You'll need to click on the download button in the top right and you'll need to accept the terms and then download the core rules. So once the download is complete, you'll see that these policies will now be populated. Let's just have a look at SQL injections. So we'll come across to edit and you'll see that it has a name and then these are all the rules that have been included in this particular policy. I'll show you what the individual rules look like in the next step and you can just see basic other settings like its value that it has, its operator and its action. Then the next thing that I want to show you is the actual rules. So if we come across to HTTPS and we go to Naxi WAF rule, then these are all the rules that we downloaded individually. So let's look at SQL keywords. I'll go to edit. And once again, you'll see it'll have a basic name and an ID. And if we come down here to the match values, we can see that there are common statements here, such as select, update, delete, union, and so on, that you would find in a typical SQL statement. So this rule is essentially looking out to match any of these particular items or these particular statements that it sees within any requests going towards the server. Now that we have the core rules and policies in place, we need to configure the location settings. This is where we link the web application to the upstream and apply the matching rules. To do this, we're gonna go back up to HTTP, click on the drop down, and then we're gonna click location. Once again, you'll see I have one that's already been created. However, you're gonna create your own. This is what the menu looks like. So you'll give it a description. I just called mine dvwa underscore location. And then the pattern that it needs to match would just be a slash. This, this is just standard. It will be populated for you automatically. And we're gonna for now just leave the match type and URL rewriting and so forth as, as default. And we're going to then enable security rules and we're gonna enable learning mode for now. And then the next setting I just want you to, to, to change here is the custom security policy. You'll see that these are all the policies which we mentioned in the previous step. You can just select the ones that apply for this, this particular web app. I've selected all of the policies that we've created. And then the final step here is just to make sure that you've selected the upstream load balancer for the, this particular web app. So it was the dvwa underscore upstream that we configured initially. And once you've done all that, you'll scroll right down to the bottom again and you'll click on save. Final step is to bring the Nginx HTTP server online. 
These settings will link the location that we set up in the previous step to the web application's URL, as well as allows us to configure any certificates and ports. In this lab, for the sake of simplicity, I've not configured any certificates. However, if this is a production environment, please make sure that you use certificates and HTTPS. So to bring the HTTP server online, you once again gonna come over to HTTPS and you're gonna to go to HTTP server. And once again, I have one that's been previously created. However, when you add your new server, you'll see a menu that looks like this. This just defines the listening addresses and the ports that it will be using. And then you're just gonna give your server a name. So in this case, I just called mine www.dvwa.local since this is hosted in my, in my lab environment. But you might have a actual legitimate domain name there that you'd like to include if this is a, a production environment. And then we're gonna link it up to the location that we created in the previous step. And if you've got any other certificates and things that need to apply, this would be the place that you would do all those things. And once you've done with it, you'll simply scroll down to the bottom and click save. So once you've completed the setup, you'll need to bring Nginx online by enabling it and clicking it up the apply button. So to do this, you'll go back to general settings, you'll select enable Nginx, and you'll click apply. Before we can access our web app, we need to create a firewall rule on the WAN interface that accepts inbound HTTP, HTTPS traffic to the firewall itself, which is now acting as our web application's reverse proxy via Nginx. So to add this firewall rule, we're gonna go over to the firewall menu, we're gonna come down to rules, and we're gonna select the WAN interface. And you'll see I've already created a, a rule here for port 80, which allows the web traffic to access my web app. Just click on edit over here. You'll see that the interface selected is the WAN interface. The direction is inbound. And our destination is this firewall because that's where Nginx is running our reverse proxy. And we'll just simply select the port range as being HTTPS. Once you've done that, you'll click save, and then you'll need to apply that firewall rule. For this lab, I've chosen to host the damn vulnerable web app in a Docker container. I'll link it in the description below, but basically it's a web app that has been made purposely vulnerable for us to practice penetration testing, and in our case, to check that our WAF is configured and that the rules are working correctly. To show the WAF in action, we're gonna simulate an injection attack on the web app while the WAF is in learning mode, which won't block the attack, it will only log the attack. So then you can see the output and the results. We will then disable the learning mode and place the WAF in a fully active mode to see how the WAF prevents us from executing the same attacks. So to start, we're gonna execute a popular SQL injection attack, which we will refer to as the always true method or a scenario where we use the percent sign or one equals one command, like you can see that I've already inputted. The percent sign does not equal anything and will therefore be false. However, one will always be equal to one, which makes the statement true. So basically, if it's true that there are user IDs in the SQL table, it will then return all of those rows to us. The full SQL statement or query will look like select first name, last name from users where user ID equals the percent sign or one equals one. So let's execute this SQL injection attack by clicking the submit button. And immediately you'll see that it's now returned to us all the names that it's picked up in the user database. So you can see first name admin, surname admin, and so on, which is a undesirable result because now the hacker can see the users that are active within this web app. The second injection attack that I want to show you is the command injection attack. 
This input allows us to ping an IP address. However, because there's no filtering or validation coded into this text field, nothing is stopping us from attempting to combine multiple commands. So in this case, we're going to ping the local host and inject a second command by using the double ampersands operator, which in Linux bash is interpreted as the logical and operator, followed by the cat command and then the file that we wish to read, which is the password file where all the registered users are stored that have access to the system. So to show you this in action, we are going to submit this injection. And after a few seconds, you will see that it returns some results. The first command was the pinging of the local host, which we can see here was successful. And then if we look just below that, we'll see that there's all these other unexpected items which have been returned. This is a result of that cat command executing correctly on the password folder. And if we scroll down, we can see these are all the active user accounts on our server where this app is hosted. This is obviously not a ideal situation as now the attacker has some idea which accounts are active on the server and he can possibly try to exploit these individual accounts further to try and get a foothold on the server. Now that we've successfully launched two attacks on our web application proving that it is vulnerable, Let's disable the learning mode on the WAF, which will allow us to block the injection attempts and attempt the same attacks again. To do this, we're gonna head back into our Nginx configurations and then to the location that we set up earlier. And we're gonna disable the learning mode. And then once you've done that, you can then scroll down to the bottom and click save. And then once it's been saved, we're going to go to general settings and then you need to make sure that you apply these settings. We're then going to open up our web app again and we're going to try redoing the SQL injection. So I'm using the same command as earlier and we're going to click submit. And you'll see immediately we have now been presented with a error message from OpenSense, which says your request has been denied for security reasons and it said that it's been logged. So this is exactly the result that we're after and this confirms that OpenSense has in fact intercepted that particular uh, SQL statement that we try to use which was illegal or undesirable and it's blocked that attempt from running on our server. We're then going to repeat the retest again on the command injection vulnerability. We'll click submit. And once again, you'll see we presented with the same error message and that request has been denied from the server completely, which shows once again that our WAF is functioning as intended. If you're interested in seeing where OpenSense logs all these errors of these attacks that we just picked up, you can head over to Nginx and then to logs and to HTTP error. And you'll see over here is a list of all those errors of those attacks that we, we picked up. This obviously comes in handy because it gives you some kind of an indication of who's attacking your server. And also if your firewall is in learning mode this is where all those those attacks are going to be displayed initially without the block so this is comes in handy if perhaps you are picking up some false positives or things along those lines and you need to make some corrections maybe with a whitelist uh, this is where you'll find all that information in the http error logs just some final thoughts. While a web application firewall does a great job at mitigating attacks against your web apps, it's no replacement for proper implemented security in both your applications front and back end. It's important that proper validation, filtering and sanitization is implemented at the code level as well. Anyway, we're going to wrap this video up for now. If you found this tutorial useful, please consider liking and subscribing to my channel. Your support is always appreciated. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.